Hey everybody, welcome to this video. So today we're going to talk about something that was requested in the comments. And I actually want to start with a thank you to everybody that's been using the comments. Um, I've been appreciating the feedback quite a bit. It really helps me understand what is interesting to you all and helps me basically generate ideas for what videos to create. So please feel free to jump in there at any point and just say stuff. Um, and actually, there have been some comments that are like, oh, couldn't you have done it this way? And often those people are right. So I love to hear those things. And um, actually, I think this video in particular is one where I think I have good methods for what we're going to talk about, but I would not be surprised at all if other people had cool ideas that might be even better than the ones that I have. So I would really love to hear from you. Use those comments. Uh, but today what we're going to talk about basically is how we can use our signal-based sequences that we've been generating uh, in all the other videos and trigger some sounds outside of Max, right? Uh, Max obviously is a, a super powerful place to do things like synthesis or trigger samples, but there's obviously a whole world of instruments that live in the outside world, uh, whether that's gear MIDI, gear, synths, hardware, whatever, or plugins, or something you have running inside your uh, DAW, or what have you. So we're going to talk today about how do we actually get from these phaser-based sequences into uh, the rest of the world. And we're going to talk about doing that in two ways. The first is using MIDI, and the second is by actually hosting a VST directly in Max and triggering it inside of Max. So this one, I guess, isn't technically outside of Max, but it is a device VST plugin that, you know, that you're not building in, in Max, but you can run them inside of Max. So we'll talk about that. Cool. So let's start off with just like a really simple sequencer. I could, I guess, skip this part and just provide one, but I feel like it's probably useful for folks that kind of want to just see that happening. Uh, and if obviously it's not valuable to you, you can skip it. So... I'm going to start with our normal combination of things, a phaser and a transport object. And let's just show the tempo. Cool. And then let's do like a subdiv. We're going to keep this simple. Subdiv the eight. And uh, we're going to use a, a table object, a table tilde at name notes, size, let's say eight, and the range is going to be uh, 24. So two octaves. And then we'll add a little, um, a little octave offset thing here. So we'll just say like plus 36. Why isn't that working? Ah, that's a signal. There we go. Cool. And then to work along with that, we will have an I table whose name is going to be notes. And so anything that I draw here is storing a set of values inside this table tilde object, which will be played back uh, by our sequencer. So let's just start things running. Oops, scope, live.scope at range. I like to go negative 0 0.1 to 1.1. I think it's a little easier. It makes a little more sense. Cool. So we have this subdivided phaser. So it's like eighth notes. And we could do a what tilde, which is going to turn those into impulses. And then we could just count those up. with a plus equals tilde. And you can see we just have a running count of those. And we've had a lot of issues with what tilde in the past. And so you know what, I'm actually gonna just do this the old fashioned way so that we don't run into those issues and so that I don't have to do a bunch of annoying editing of this video the way I have in the last few ones. So because we're, you know, we're, we're just working with the simplest use case for what tilde, which is just this 
recognizing when the phaser goes back to the bottom. Um, so I'll copy that exact thing again. And I'll take the output from the phaser, the first phaser, and then I'll use that to reset our counter. So effectively now what we're doing here is counting out the, um, the subdivisions. And actually, I think I just, I realized at this exact moment that I think, oh, see subdiv, it puts out a floating point number. Oh, wait. Ah, wonderful. So we don't even have to do this. Man, max 8.3. I'm going to add one. Actually, no, I'm not going to add one to that. I'm going to keep it starting at zero. Cool. So literally all we have to do is pass it in. Man, that's so cool. Cool. So, sorry, all of that aside, we're just literally taking this middle outlet of subdiv... Because it will put from its leftmost outlet a phaser, but from its middle one, it's just going to tell us which of the subdivisions it's on, which is brilliant. And so then we're getting uh, it to look up from this table. So if I set the values all to like 20 and 21, you could see that's what I'm getting. Cool. And to make our like life a little more interesting, let's also do uh, some like a velocity one. And the range for that one is going to be 120, I guess seven, because we don't really want zero. So I'm just going to add zero or add one to the output. And again, I made the same mistake. Okay. Same thing. And then we'll do again, I table at name velocity. So that's the velocities right there. And I'm going to be a little anal and make these the same size. Cool. And then one more let's actually do, and we'll call it like timbre. And this is what we're actually going to use to send control change in the MIDI case, or just some other, um, some other parameter that influences some other aspect of the sound other than the note and the velocity. So I'm going to create another iTable object and I'm going to call and I'm going to have it reference that timbre table. Cool. So in the past you've seen we've used stash for this same uh, purpose and that works too. Today we'll use table tilde. And then, uh, so like that's basically our sequencer, in fact, <laughs> done. Um, we have a bunch of um, little phaser ramps, which we could easily convert to impulses, which sort of signify the onset of these notes. We have notes we have velocities and we have these kind of running uh, timbral type of values. So if we wanna actually trigger something, we can do that. So I have an um, instrument in, uh, in Max for Live and actually I will just play that for you really quickly. So I'm creating a MIDI out and I'm assigning it to the MIDI device that I have targeted in Live and let me just show you Live really quickly. So I have a wavetable here. You can ignore this second channel. It's for my own monitoring. Um, and I have the MIDI device that it's listening to is from Max to channel one. And then here I double click the MIDI out object. I say from Max two, and then I'm gonna just combine, uh, let's say, or we'll just send, let's send the value of like, I don't know, 40. And I'm going to send that into a make note object, make note 100 to 100. And what make note does is basically it allows me to send in a note value or a note and a velocity. And it will, after a certain amount of time, in this case, 100 milliseconds, which is what this second 100 means, uh, send out the note off event. So if I, um, if I actually join its two outputs, and I click 40 here, you can see it sends 100, and actually, let me make this like 100 and like, I don't know, 300. 
you could see it goes 40, 100, and then 40, 0. So that 0 is the node off event. And I'm just going to pass that into the first inlet of MIDI format, which is going to create a MIDI note and send it over to Ableton and trigger this sound. It's kind of low. Let me turn it, let me uh, bring it up a little bit just to make sure that you are able to hear it. Cool. Great. So basically, what we're trying to do is get this system to conform to this. And what we're doing here is signal to float or signal to integer conversion, uh, because the MIDI objects that send MIDI out in Max, they don't accept signals. And MIDI in general is like an event based system, uh, more than, you know, than audio is. So this is one of those areas where, you know, we have our wonderful signal based sequencer, but at some point in time, in this particular case, we eventually need to just do some conversion. So a way to do that is with the snapshot object, uh, whose job is basically exactly this. So if I attach, say, a message box, uh, there's a couple ways to use snapshot. And I think I might have talked about this in the past. The first one is to give it an argument, like, say, 100. And what it's basically just going to do is uh, sample this, this signal at a 100 milliseconds interval. So every 100 milliseconds, it'll just grab whatever the current value is and output it. Um, that can work, but I think that a much better way, particularly for us right now, is to use the other method, which is to bang it. So we can send a bang and get it to sample exactly when we want it to. And we know that we want it to basically every time there's a new subdivision. So we can use our delta tilde to less than zero tilde, which is going to convert this saw-like thing into just a series of impulses. And then send that into an edge tilde, which is responsible for basically uh, turning these impulse spikes into bangs. So now we have basically every time there's a new note event, we actually sample. And this is great because if we use just that millisecond argument for snapshot, it would cause us some problems, which is that it would the the point at which snapshot samples, which is the point at which it's going to tell, you know, through MIDI the instrument to trigger the sound, is lined up with this you know this millisecond sample interval in snapshot. It's not lined up with when our note event is actually happening. So using this method, we're actually firing off that bang as close as possible to when that note event actually occurs within our signal-based sequencing system as possible. And I know, or I, I'm pretty sure, that actually both edge tilde and I think snapshot as well um, have undergone some significant improvements in the last uh, few versions of Max, I think actually in 8.3, that uh, improve the timing accuracy of these, these objects as well. So um, this should actually be pretty rock solid timing-wise. Um, and this is actually probably a good time to talk about audio settings. So if you go into your options menu and you go to audio status, there's a few things um, to think about. So actually, this is a brand new instance of Mac, so I don't have scheduler and overdrive enabled. Usually, you want to have scheduler and overdrive enabled. And if you have a powerful computer, you might also want to do um, scheduler and audio interrupt. I'm just going to leave that off for now, but um, you can experiment with that. Basically what these do is control how highly prioritized events, scheduled events are in Max. Um, there's actually a really good video on, or a series of videos on Cycling74's website about this. I'll try to find the link and put it in the video description. But basically there's kind of, when we're talking about, there's like three different threads, processing threads in Max. The first one is the lowest priority, which is non-scheduled events. Um, so this would be like just clicking a bang, like clicking a button, like this. And then there's events that 
pass through some sort of timing object. So like if I pass it through a delay, I think even like a delay zero, it's gonna move it into this scheduler thread. And then there's audio. And there's a basic uh, sort of prioritization where the highest priority is audio. It doesn't wanna drop any of those samples. Then the scheduler and then the, um, the regular events. Scheduler and overdrive does something that I don't, to be honest with you, totally understand to, um, to basically improve the accuracy of these scheduled events. So the ones that, you know, are triggered by a metro or I believe triggered by an edge tilde or whatever. And it seems like most of the time I haven't encountered very many situations in which you shouldn't be enabling schedule and overdrive. I think there are some jitter situations where you might not want to enable this, but most people seem to have it on pretty much all the time. Audio interrupt means that the scheduled events are treated as high priority as audio is. So sometimes you might find that you need that. I find that with these kinds of settings, as well as these vector size things, which we might talk about a little bit in this video, a little later on when we talk about VST tilde, um, the best way to kind of work, like figure out what the best settings are is to just play around and figure out what works for you because it's really based on what you're doing and your computer. So that's that. Cool. So now that we have this, we can just connect it to our make note and get some sound. And this sequence is already kind of cool. I wonder if that's too loud for you. I might try to turn it down just a little bit. Turn it down for me too, which is here. Actually, it isn't, or is it? Ah, oh, here, there we go. Okay, so let's get the velocity working here. So we're gonna do literally the same thing, snapshot. And we're just gonna hit that same edge. I'm gonna take the button out of the path here and pass the signal into the snapshot and into this second inlet of make note. So hopefully, I think this instrument is not the most uh, responsive to velocity, but hopefully you can hear that in some cases it's a little louder. Maybe I'll adjust our offset a little bit here. So let's maybe go up another octave to 48. It appears actually that our instrument is like really not velocity responsive. There we go. And then the final one is this timbre thing. So if I go over to Wavetable, which has this pretty awesome like MIDI matrix, I already have it set up so that the mod wheel, which is um, CC number controller number one, will control this um, this uh, Wavetable um, scan. So I all I need to do there is snapshot that value as well and then I'm just gonna pack that with a uh, the value of one because the first uh, controller is the mod wheel and I'm gonna pass that into this uh, third inlet of MIDI format I think that's working, is it? Let's drop a MIDI monitor in here. We're not getting what we expected to though, why? We keep getting four, 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 why? Ah. <laughs> 
you can't attach signals to number tilde objects. Cool. So now we're getting this modulation of the timbre. This is already kind of cool. I dare say this is the coolest thing we've had so far on this channel. I, one thing that I'm sort of upset about is, uh, I'm gonna turn it down a little bit, that I feel like the sounds I've been using in these videos have kind of sucked. And because I'm kind of mixing on the fly without being able to hear your output, I'm just gonna turn it up so you can hear it for a second. All right, so that's ex that example uh, with MIDI. So the possibilities run very deep there. Um, and yeah, you just use snapshot. If anybody can think of a better way to do that, I would love to hear it. Um, but I think it works pretty well, actually. It'd be cool if there was like a, I guess there is mc.snapshot. So like if you really wanted to get fancy, uh, and I won't go too far down this rabbit hole, but like you could use mc.pack and like combine these three signals into, uh, um, into a multi-channel signal and then send them into mc.snapshot and then like unpack them. If you had like a ton, it might be a little bit more helpful because then you can hit it with just the one bang. Um, so that would be maybe useful if you just found that there was like snapshot objects all over your patch. Okay. So I'm gonna disconnect this MIDI out so that we don't have that triggering anymore. And now we're gonna talk about using the VST object. And for this one, I'm going to use a plugin called Chromophone. Chromophone, I think it's three. My computer's gonna to need to wait for a little bit while it tries to load that. Assuming that worked. Cool. Uh, this is an awesome plugin in my opinion. And uh, we'll just stick with this default sound. It's like a physical modeling thing. I'll show you a little bit later. And so what we want to do is basically get this VST object that lives inside of Max to play that sound. And we need to hook the VST object up to a, um, a DAC to actually create an output. And again, these second outputs are just for my own, my own ears. And you know what? Let me give you a, a gain. Oops. Cool. And I really like a horizontal gain object. Where is the orientation? Okay, great. Um, so you can just send, I'm pretty sure, regular MIDI messages to this, but we're not gonna do that. We're gonna use a really cool object called mc.midi player. And it accepts three things, and they're all signals. The first is a trigger, the second is a note, and the third is a velocity. And if we go look at the help patch, there's a lot here. Under triggers, there's a few different options for trigger types, so trigger mode. And there's the normal one is called... Let's see, I think it's called phaser. Normal one's called phaser, the second one's called edge, the third one's called change. Change is like you send the same note value into it and it actually just detects a change in that value. And that's not great because if you send the same note twice but you wanna have new onset, you're not. it's not gonna detect that. So like, and because we're already getting, uh, you know, subdiv to output a phaser, um, then like, let's just use that. Um, another thing that we could do, which actually might even be a little bit better, is to use the ramp object. Because ramp will take an impulse. Yeah, let's do this. So ramp is gonna take an impulse like we get from uh, our what tilde thing that we made. And it will make a ramp the length of whatever number you give it. And then that actually allows us to have a little bit of envelope control. 
So if I just show you here, this is yet another, by the way, uh, 8.3 object. So you're seeing there, we're getting just a ramp from zero to one over, uh, over 100 milliseconds. And so the mc.midi player object, when we pass that into the first inlet here, it actually basically, when, it, when we're using this trigger mode zero, which I believe is the default, it is, it will basically detect the beginning of the uh, the ramp as the node on event, quote unquote, and the end of the ramp, the sort of uh, diving back down to zero as the the end of the, the node, the node off event. So with that, all we have to do is just take our values straight out the uh, the node and velocity. And if I did everything correctly, it should just work. So let's test it. So it's kind of working, but we're getting this normal thing. And this is exactly why I was saying we might talk about audio status again. I have found that for certain combinations of signal vector size, and IO vector size that you get these issues. So you, again, just have to play around. Let's see if 512, 512 works better. It does. So if that happens where you get this like weird, like modulated kind of thing, just go over there and change that. Wonderful. Uh, the only other thing with this now is mc.midi player which is pretty cool. So like this connection down here, it's not, I don't think actually a signal. Like if you go to the help, that's a text from my girlfriend, please ignore that. Professional channel we have here. Um, this connection, they call it the secret MIDI event message to VST tilde. So I don't think this is actually a signal. Like if you hook up, I wonder what would happen if we hook like a meter up to this. Like, are we gonna get anything? No, it's not actually a signal. It's just like a way for us to tell the VST tilde object to like receive the data from this mc.midi player. And honestly, under the hood, what may be happening is something very similar to what we're doing with the snapshot. I have no idea, but whatever. It seems to work pretty well. Something, Probably a little bit different though, given that we're having this bizarre behavior with the different um, signal vector and IO vector settings. Um, but the mc.midi player object doesn't have inputs for things like CCs. So if we want to send those uh, or send timbre data, we can still do that. Um, VST tilde object doesn't use MIDI in general. I think you can send it MIDI actually. Like you could send it a CC. But because you have a VST loaded into your uh, computer, the part of the like VST protocol is kind of an awareness of what parameters are exposed to that, um, or what exists, what parameters exist within that VST. So if I send the object the message params, then from its third outlet, it's going to output a list of params, and I can just dump those into a um, a U menu, and you can see there's a whole, oh, there's like a ton of them. Um, and the chromophone object, which I will, or not object, but VST, which I'll bring back up, has like a literal gazillion parameters, but it has this pretty cool like macros thing on the first page, and you can kind of map these macros to different, uh, different things. So if I run this again, and I just play, Okay, so the envelope, that's an easy one. Or what about the timbre? That has a pretty noticeable effect. So we'll go with that. So what I'm gonna do is just create a join um, at triggers one. And I'm gonna pass macros timbre. And then our sampled value So in this case, we're using uh, we're using an event. So we are going to use this sampled signal because to do this timbre stuff, 
you can't use MC MIDI play, you can't use a signal directly. Um, so we'll just do, we'll grab from the snapshot and the VST tilde object, I'm gonna pause this. For these parameter values, it wants them on a, a zero to one a floating point range. So it doesn't want zero to 27 the way that MIDI typically does. So we will, and actually this really should be range 128 if we're being anal about it. Um, and then we'll pass that in. So we're gonna get, and I'm just gonna turn this down. A message that looks like this. And then if we pass it into VST tilde. You can see we're getting, we can hear you, we're getting that kind of modulation. And honestly, I feel like this timbral sequencing thing really makes the patterns a lot more interesting musically. Like it just is cooler. So I recommend doing it. So this video has been going for like 30 minutes. I think I'm gonna stop it there. There's one other thing that I would love to talk a little bit about. Um, and we will at some, maybe in another one, which is, so with the make note object, um, it handles polyphony nicely. And when we say polyphony here, we're not working in this particular case with a system that's like playing any chords really, right? Like it isn't going to try to send two note values at the same time, which if you're trying to do that, that's like a whole new set of problems that you need to solve. Um, but we could have situations where say our duration value, which we could set by passing a floating or an integer, it doesn't really matter, I think you could pass a float into the right inlet. Say this is like a thousand. Um, if it's a, you know, a thousand is a full second, which means that you're gonna have notes where the uh, at this eighth note subdivision, you're gonna have new notes starting before the prior ones end. And so you need to keep track of the noting starting points, the onsets and the, and the, the ends of all of these notes uh, when that's happening. Um, Cause you can't assume that the last one has ended when you start the new one. Make note kind of has this baked in. So like, even if we have a really long note duration and I send it, um, you know, a bunch of MIDI note values, it's going to be aware that I have multiple active notes at one time, and it will still just intelligently send the note off events for each of those at the correct point. So if, for example, I send, you know, 55, and then I send 56, 200 milliseconds later, it'll send 55, 100, and then 200 milliseconds later, it'll send 56, 100, and then 800 milliseconds later, it'll send 55, zero, ending that first note, and then 200 milliseconds later, 56, zero. So make notes really cool in that it like takes a thing that is typically pretty annoying and, uh, and complicated and kind of just handles it for you. And then as far as the sort of more complex settings regarding polyphony go with things like voice stealing, like what do you do if you're out of voices or what do you do if you send the same note twice? Like that's all handled by the synthesizer. Um, so Max doesn't worry about that in this case. If you are using this technique of MC.MIDI player, um, you don't get that same capability out of the box. Like if I try to send a ramp and I'll just do it, like I'll click here. If I, let's make this like a, a thousand, or yeah, a thousand milliseconds. And I click this and then click it again. The second time I clicked, it didn't do anything. Um, and that's because the first ramp wasn't done. There is an attribute of ramp called retrigger, which is default off. But if you turn it on, it will actually start a new one. But in that case, it's like attenuating the prior note um, and starting a new one. If we wanted this thing like we have with make note where they actually overlap, um, what you would wanna do 
is send an MC signal that um, has a different event on each uh, channel. So probably not, I'm not going to get into that now just because I think it's another probably half hour of discussion, particularly for anybody who's not familiar with MC, which we did touch a little bit on today. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that one in the future. Like how do you actually have uh, these overlapping notes um, with MC.MIDI player using MC. Okay, uh, let me know if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, if you have any ideas for how to do things like this better, if anything was confusing to you, et cetera, et cetera. I'd love to hear those things. And next time, uh, maybe next time we'll talk about this thing, but I also have a few other ideas which I would love to get your thoughts on. Number one is... Uh, Euclidean pattern generation, which is actually kind of a basic one, and we could probably get through pretty quickly and is really fun. Um, and then the other one, which I was thinking about earlier today, is uh, the actual value selection. So, so far we've been working with uh, these systems where we pretty much just have these like pretty simple kind of arrays of values, and we're just looking up and just counting from beginning to end. Uh, but there's a lot of other things we could do. We could select randomly. We could do like a ping pong thing where we go from the beginning to the end and back uh, and back from the beginning or the end to the beginning. We can do like a drunken walk. We can um, do a whole nother idea, which is like have these, have a bunch of sliders that set a weighted distribution that like selects using probability notes from a scale. So I like would yeah, I totally want to get into some of those concepts. That's like a few videos there, but if any of those is really exciting to you, make a comment and you will uh, succeed in having that video be prioritized. Okay, thanks. Have a great week.